As a traveler, have you ever been overwhelmed by your destination? You read the books you planned every day down to the last minute, only to realize that nothing could prepare you for actually being there? Well, I'm in London, England right now, completely bowled over by how massive the city is. I mean, take a look at the map. I'm just realizing I'm not going to be able to do everything that I plan to do. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to stick to the classics, things that are quintessential London, like enjoying a pint in a pub. This is the Red Lion, gorgeous pub. It's over 200 years old. And uh, once I finish this pint, my assimilation into the English culture will be complete. Say the word London and what comes to mind? Double-decker buses, royal palaces, driving on the left side of the street. It's the capital of the United Kingdom, England's largest city. And if you've never been to Europe, London is the perfect place to visit first. This is a classic London landmark, Trafalgar Square. We are quite literally now in the center of London. So it's a main gathering place uh, for people and pigeons. It's a pigeon problem here and people keep feeding them. I just, I don't get it. Don't get why you'd feed the pigeons. <laughs> This very, very tall column pays tribute to Lord Admiral Nelson. He was Britain's finest sea lord. He died in the Battle of Trafalgar against Napoleon in 1805. And he is guarded by four massive lions. And what's great is that kids are allowed to play all over him. Actually, that's not a kid right there. But he's having fun nonetheless. And you can even see the kids slide down the bums. It's cute. Now, right behind me is one of the world's most respected museums, the National Gallery of Art. You want masterpieces? They got masterpieces. And you're going to love this. It is absolutely free to go inside. And they've got great bathrooms. Now, Trafalgar Square is known for more than one oddity. Over there, do you see that sort of looks like a, a lamppost? Well, that is affectionately known as the world's smallest police station. Back in the day, one bobby, or policeman, would fit inside. Now it's just used as a, a storage closet, but it's still charming. Now, right over there is an empty pedestal, and that was supposed to be for uh, William IV, his statue. But after the king died, he didn't leave enough money for it to be erected, so the man gets no statue. You're making your way to the Buckingham Palace via the mall through Admiralty Arch. Take note that Lord Admiral Nelson is gazing towards the palace and looking out over his own fleet. See the tops of the lampposts? Well, they're topped with models of his battleships. So we're on our way to see one of the top attractions in London, the changing of the guard. And I know sophisticated travelers roll their eyes, it's so cliche, but I just didn't want to miss this. The changing of the guard takes place at Buckingham Palace, the official residence of Her Majesty the Queen, and it's been the home of Britain's sovereign since 1837. Now just a few stats, got 600 rooms and a staff of 300. It's good to be the queen. And in the summer when the royals are away for their vacation, visitors may go in and visit some of the state rooms, so good to know. Now you know every tourist wants to see the changing of the guard, so be there at least an hour before the 11.30 a.m. start time. You want choice views? Well, a good place is Victoria's statue. Face away from the palace looking straight down the mall. That's where the foot soldiers march from. In front of the palace, you'll see the guards retreat through the front gate after the ceremony. But of course, the best position is to the left of the main gate, front row, hands on the bars. Honestly, it's hard to tell exactly what they're doing. I mean, there's a lot of marching back and forth for no apparent reason. Okay, now these guys are leaving. Okay, now they're back. Basically, this is just a very elaborate ceremony showing one guy's punching in for the day, another guy's punching out. The whole ceremony takes a half hour. August through March, it's held every other day. And if it's raining, you may not see it at all. So check with your hotel before you head out. If you weren't able to get the best view at Buckingham Palace, excuse me, could you uh, take my picture? Of course, come. Just down the street is St. James Palace. Here, you really can get up close. But tempting as it is, touching the Queen's guards okay. is frowned upon. This 
is an exceptionally green city. It is filled with parks. Uh, they're considered the lungs of London. Many of the parks were once uh, the king's private hunting grounds. Uh, right now you're looking at St. James Park, which is truly one of London's loveliest. In a city as big as London, there are lots of ways of getting around. Did you know that one of the best, most fun things you can do in London Taxi. is take a cab? Hello. Hello there. How are you? Fine. How are you keeping? Excellent. Good. First of all, London cabs are extremely spacious and comfortable vehicles. Then there's the cabbie himself. How long have you been a cabbie? 34 years. 34 years? 34 years. I'd like to go to uh, Seashells. Absolutely, my dear. I'll take you. Tell any cab, and you are likely to find a courteous and highly knowledgeable person. This is a great time to get some solid advice. It's a lovely restaurant. When you go there, you either ask for rock and chips or cotton chips. But cotton chips is number one. I'm in London, so I've got to have them. Fish and chips is a Londoner's ultimate fast food. In fact, fish and chip restaurants in the city far outnumber even McDonald's. You open the batter up, you put a little bit of salt in, you put a little bit of vinegar on. Maybe use pepper if you like pepper, and that's it. A London cabbie is trained in what's called the knowledge. Which you go to a special school for that. It takes four years to do it. You must have no criminal record whatsoever, and you must be able to read and write the Queen's English. They test you out for your temperament as well. They have to do this. Basically, they have to know every street in London and the shortest distance from pickup to drop off. And it's your accent Cockney. Yes, my accent is Cockney. I yeah. love it. All right, I'll be right back, Ronnie. Okay. Hello. Hello. May I help you? Yeah, I was gonna. Wow. Haddock, box, skate, salmon. Yeah. Got a lot. Uh, yeah. The most popular is cod. That's what I heard. I'll yeah. have. A, I'll have cod. Cod. Mm-hmm. That's so what I'll do. Just salt vinegar first, and then I give you the fish on the top. Okay. Yeah. Right. Go on one cut. Thank you. Here we go. Enjoy gorgeous. your meal. Yeah. I will. Thank you very much. Thank bye bye. You. <laughs> Mm. Okay, how is that? It's wonderful. Hope you, hope you don't forget the salt and vinegar I and got pepper. lots of vinegar, too. Oh, lovely. I love it. Great. Would you like a chip, Ronnie? <laughs> the coronation chair here. Next, we'll walk where kings and queens were crowned. Then, we'll give a toast to English traditions when Passport to Europe returns. When you think of experiencing quintessential London, you think of uh, going to the Tower of London, seeing the changing of the guard, eating fish and chips, and of course, taking your picture next to this. Now, all my life, I've seen pictures of this, and I thought, that's Big Ben. Well, I'm wrong, kind of, sort of. Uh, Big Ben does not refer to the clock tower itself. It actually is the massive bell inside, which weighs around 13 tons. It's a four-sided clock that faces 23 feet in diameter, and the minute hand is 14 feet long. So that makes it the largest clock in Britain. The clock tower is connected to the Houses of Parliament. In a nutshell, this is where the British government meets, and you gotta hand it to them. It is one gorgeous building. It's just so overwhelming, not only in size, but in architecture. It's neo-Gothic in design, and uh, every inch seems to be styled with a certain flourish. And it made me think, remember Buckingham Palace? It was very impressive, but it's sort of austere, you know, sober. And that's the home of kings and queens. This is where the politicians are. If I was the queen, I'd kick them all out. That'd be my home. Oh, and I also read that along with having some 1,000 rooms, there are also six restaurants and eight bars. None of them open to the public. Nice. <laughs> Next, we'll head right down the street to Westminster Abbey. Its history is so vast and important, it's best to go on a tour or get a guide. I met up with Martin Castledine. He's a verger, or lay minister, at the Abbey. Here we are, Sammy, now in the nave of Westminster Abbey. Incredible. Quite big. Yes. Huge. There's been a coronation um, on this site since 1066, which and that's, is William the Conqueror. And that's when you crown a king. That's or a when queen. you crown a king and a queen, our new monarch. Yes. Yeah, so this little corner of the Abbey is known as Scientist's Corner. On the left hand side, you've got the memorial to Sir Isaac Newton. Uh -huh. And directly in front of it on the floor is actually where he's buried. He's buried right there. So Isaac Newton's buried there, but also Charles Darwin is buried as well. Are you serious? Now, a lot of people are very surprised that Darwin yeah. is here. And here we go, we've got uh, the coronation chair here, which effectively is the throne of England. Oh. As you can see, it's a really old condition, mainly because it's over 700 years old. 700 years well, old. Over 700 years old. But previously, in its olden days, uh, the coronation chair was literally just placed anywhere in the Abbey. Uh, so people used to come and sit in it and play in it. And then, as you can see, there's lots of graffiti. They used to carve their initials in it. So this is the chair that we've seen on television where they lower the crown that's down right. onto the head and they officially become that's the right. king or the queen. Yes, wow. that's the coronation chair. <laughs> Oh, it's 
just astounding, isn't it? The, the history here. It's going to going to take a while to absorb. Uh, I wanted to walk around Poets' Corner. This is an area in the Abbey which memorializes this country's most brilliant writers. You have uh, uh, William Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Geoffrey Chaucer, and I have a very strong emotional connection with these three men because they were responsible for lowering my high school GPA. And I just wanted to, you know, take a moment, say hello. Uh, my safety school actually turned out all right, and I'm actually doing all right in life, so thanks. <laughs> On a lazy summer day in London, you can't miss out on the neighborhood pub. So I hooked up with my old friend Matt for a drink. Hello. Hello. Hi there. So, a Pims? Yeah, yeah, that's right there. Well, we'll get a picture of Pims, thanks. That'd be great. So what is a Pims? Kind of like the uh, English sangria. It's the, uh, most people drink beer during the year, but when the sun comes out, so does the Pims and lemonade. So, it tastes sweet, but they definitely add up. (laughs) (laughs) Pims number one is gin-based. It's gin. Yeah, and Pims number six is vodka-based, and there used to be a few others as well. This looks great. Welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I notice that there are no uh, surfers here. No, um, you, you go up to the bar and order mm-hmm. order drinks yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and also, partly because of that, you, you don't tip here either. You don't is, tip? No, one yeah. saving that you can have on your on your trip. <laughs> right, so. <right>. Exactly. <laughs> so maybe at the end of the night, you can give them a pound to say thanks for good service. But they're service. not expecting it to. No, it's not expected like in America. Oh. So pubs here close at 11 p.m.? 11 o'clock, so really? you better get your drinks in. When they close, it's not as though you've got nothing to do. You can go out to, uh, to a bar or to a nightclub. Oh, so our it. night isn't ending with this. No, we've got another 12 hours of this to go. <laughs> cheers. cheers. And you say cheers, do you? Always say cheers. Okay. <laughs> cheers. So. And I noticed that people stand outside. You, you're allowed to drink with a beer oh, outside. absolutely. Because remember, in the States, you can't do that no, beer. You'd be arrested. On a warm summer's day, there are more people outside than uh-huh. inside. Just an accepted part of culture, which is really, really nice. Yeah. It's nice seeing you give that. <laughs> Cheers again. Cheers again. <laughs> Think all English hotels are stuffy? Not this one. Here's Terrible Terry. He's in charge of the hotel. Watch out for this guy. Plus, my whirlwind tour of the most famous store outside of the United States. Next. level with you. Hotels in London start at expensive and go to very expensive. So my idea was to stay in a really nice hotel, but in one of its least expensive rooms. I also wanted a hotel that was central to the things that I wanted to do, like Buckingham Palace and uh, Trafalgar Square. So why don't you take a look at the Stafford. The Stafford is a part of the small luxury hotels of the world. It's located in an area of London known as St. James. Hello, Frank. Good afternoon, Miss Brown. How are you? Excellent. Good. Would that be all room key? I would like it. Thank you. You always leave your key at the front desk, which is nice, because then you never lose it. There you are, man. Thanks a lot. So I chose the Stafford because I wanted a, uh, a quintessentially English experience, one that was intimate and personal. If you look around the lobby, you'll see that all these qualities are here. Let's check out the lounge. This is a really charming sitting area. and see they're setting up for tea. Quintessentially English. So here's my room. Make yourself at home. Um, all the rooms here are decorated in an English countryside decor. And for me, the room really fits the bill because what I didn't want to have happen is to go out into elegant classic London only to come back to a you know, plain cookie cutter type hotel. So this room is just, for me, it's just perfect. And look at this. They give you a stack of uh, calling cards and they read, my residence whilst in London. Great touch. And my favorite, though, was when I checked in, I got a packet of cards which introduced the staff to me. Um, you know how the British are known to be a little, little stuffy? Not here. A little rundown on the people you need to know. Here's Terrible Terry. He's in charge of the hotel. Watch out for this guy. There's Burnett Dave, the executive chef. The head concierge is known as Fix-It Frank. So again, there's a great sense of humor. And I don't know about you, but that's really important to me. When I'm on vacation, I, I like to think that the staff is a part of that. And uh, here they definitely are. Before we head back out, I wanted to show you the American bar here at the Stafford. It's just a, a cozy, snug of a place, isn't it? And it's decorated entirely with paraphernalia and mementos left by past and returning guests. And there's a great story as to why this is called the American bar. Back during the time between the two wars, London mainly had pubs serving beer. Well, in the United States, there was a trend happening. Cocktails, martinis, sidecars, Manhattans, and they were slowly coming across the Atlantic. Now, to show people that they served American cocktails, uh, they were called American in bars. Hello. This 
is the Burlington Arcade. It's a handsome passageway lined with very distinctive shops. Now, what makes this a great place to peruse is that it is patrolled by Beatles. That's with a D, not a T. And they are here to make sure that we are on our best behavior. They've actually been patrolling the Burlington Arcade for over 175 years. And this is no joke. There is no singing, no whistling, and no hurrying. So maybe I should even slow it down more. Oh, come here, look at this. And when you're walking around an area as nice as Mayfair, be on the lookout for one of these. It's called a royal warrant. And let's read it here. It says, by appointment to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Now, basically what this says is that this shop provides goods to the royal household. <laughs> I think that's cool. Hello. Afternoon. Can I have a shoe shine, please? Yeah, that's a for that bad place. Excuse me. It's about the only thing I can afford in this arcade. <laughs> yes, it's an expensive part of town. It's lovely, though. Pretty scuffy, huh? <laughs> you're not going to spit on them? No, you're not allowed to spit in the Burlington Arcade. <laughs> if you're looking to supersize your shopping list, then there's only one place in London big enough to fill the order. Harrods isn't just a department store, it's an extravaganza. There are 330 departments on seven floors. You can buy anything here from a solid gold putter to a saddle made to order. Be sure to pick up a shopping guide when you come in or you won't know your way around. Me, I'm here for the food. Do you know what this is? This is the most luxurious shopping market in the world. I mean, you can buy everything here. Uh, you can buy your cheese, your meat, your fruit, your vegetables, all the prepared foods, and eggs. Look at this assortment. Oh my gosh. You can even buy an ostrich egg. Not today. You'll want to buy something in Harrods if only to get the bag. A bag here is like getting a, a Bloomingdale's bag back in New York City. The main gripe against London is that it is so expensive, and it really is. Sometimes goods here cost about double what they do back at home. You just want to protest sometimes. This is £4.25, which is around $7.50. That's actually a really good price. I buy tea a lot, so everyone's getting tea. <laughs> The food hall here has many counters where you can have yourself a really wonderful meal. I thought since I'm in a, a luxury department store, I would end my shopping excursion here in a luxurious way. I was just out taking a walk along the Thames. Behind me is the Tower Bridge, which a lot of people mistakenly call the London Bridge. And actually, that's one down. It's pretty nondescript, so you think, well, that looks like a bridge you write a nursery rhyme about. Anyway, it's my last night here, and uh, I've just been thinking, wow, I've really been able to see and do a lot in London. And then I think, actually, I, I haven't even scratched the surface. So instead of reminiscing about my wonderful trip to this city, I'm walking the Thames, contemplating, when am I going to get back to London, and what am I going to do next? If you want to learn more about what I did in Europe, talk about the show, or check out my photos and journal, log on to Travel Channel at discovery.com. See you there.